Hey everyone, uh, my name is Daniel Ayala. I'm one of the co-organizers of Yale Tech. Thanks again for coming out. Um, before we announce our next speaker, I just want to thank everyone who's been on Twitter tweeting this entire morning. Uh, we are like trending on my hyper-personalized Twitter <laughs> trending feed, which is awesome. But I want us to keep doing that. And more importantly, there's a Startup Columbia event that's actually happening right now. And they are like ranked number 17 and we're ranked number two. So I'd like for us to like continue to be that high. Uh, so if you could please keep tweeting throughout the day, share photos, et cetera, that'd be awesome. Thanks a lot. Do you want Yale Tech 16 or Yale Tech? Uh, Yale Tech 16. Yeah, cool. Uh, cool. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Allison Wagenfeld. Uh, she's the incoming head of marketing for Google Enterprise, which includes the Google Cloud Platform, Google Apps, Enterprise Google Maps, and the uh, education teams. Uh, Allison was previously an operating partner at Emergence Capital, um, where she worked on investments including Textio, Handshake, and Steelbrick. And prior to that, she was the executive director of the Harvard Business School California Research Center. Um, and then prior to that, was actually a co-founder and director of marketing for Quicken Loans at Intuit. Uh, so she, she spent quite a bit of time in the Valley and has a lot to share. Um, Allison graduated from Yale uh, with an undergrad degree and then did an MBA at Harvard. Uh, so please welcome Allison. She's going to be talking about um, how to navigate a career in, in the technology industry. Hi. Now right on the heels of that uh, Twitter announcement, now my Twitter is going to be trending. So, um, so I'm Allison Berkeley Wagenfeld. I'm at this kind of interesting phase in my career because this is my one week off of transition where I am transitioning from my role at Emergence Capital last week and moving into a, this role at Google starting next Monday. So the timing of this conference is great. And what I thought it might be interesting to talk about is career trend, um, just kind of career growth in general in Silicon Valley because it, it's very different than what I thought it would be when I was graduating from Yale and graduating from business school and talk about some of the different elements of that and then there'll be certainly time for questions and I'll be here over the course of the day. So I'm not going to be digging in as much into venture capital but happy to talk about that later on or over lunch or anything like that for those of you that are raising. I'm always happy to help advise along those lines. But as I said, I'm focusing more on um, kind of building a fulfilling career. And this kind of, I may move. Can you guys see? Because uh, I, the screen, yeah, well, I guess you have to take one. Okay. So one of my first kind of key points is that I found that most careers in Silicon Valley are very much non-linear. And this concept of a, the corporate ladder seems really outdated. And... Uh, the, a friend of mine from Yale, Lori Guller, has used the term the jungle gym is another way of thinking about it. And so I thought I would walk you through initially some of my career, trans the way it's kind of gone on in the different transitions, and then talk about some of the guiding principles that I have seen with others here in Silicon Valley. Um, so I was going to actually build the slide, but it doesn't build from here, so I'll just walk you through it, starting with the... Um, First part, so graduated from Yale in 91, went from there to Morgan Stanley, where I was an investment banking analyst for two years in New York doing M&A in the kind of days of Bonfire of the Vanities, and then went to Hong Kong for a year to work in financing, a lot of global financings. Great uh, opportunity, and while I was at Morgan Stanley, I didn't love investment banking, but it was a certainly a great foundation. And one of the most interesting elements of it is when I was in Hong Kong, I'm going to date myself here, halfway through the year they turned on email for us. And yeah, that's what happened in 1993. And it completely changed how all of us worked. And suddenly this concept of doing all-nighters, which were so consistent in banking, basically at 8 p.m. we would send all of our files to the analyst in New York, who would then work on them for 12 hours and then send them back. And it had such a fundamental change in our office. And it was this really eye-opening experience, which I know just kind of sounds so trivial now, but that how much technology can change lives. And so that has been a really guiding principle for me. So when I came back to the States and went to business school at Harvard Business School, I knew that I wanted to work in tech. And the hard part then was getting a tech job because all I had in my resume was investment banking. So like any kind of assertive, kind of Yale and HBS type of person. I was like, okay, nobody's going to interview me. What do I do here? And when Microsoft came to campus, I 
did not get on that interview schedule. And then I went at 7 a.m. to the career services area and knocked on the door of the guy who was interviewing. His name was Russ Siegelman. And said, if I bring you lunch, will you interview me during lunch? And I think he was a little bit taken aback and was kind of like, okay. And I ended up going there, interviewing with him during lunch and getting hired by Microsoft to work that summer in Russ Siegelman's group, which was the MSN group. And that was the summer of Windows 95, the summer of Microsoft's internet tidal wave memo, things were changing, and the launch of MSN. I loved my product role, and I actually enjoyed working at Microsoft. I just didn't want to be in Seattle. So when I graduated, I was looking for roles in the Bay Area. And I had a really hard time. It was early internet days, a really hard time figuring out which, what would be a good startup to go to and whether or not it should even go to a startup at that point. I actually got some advice to go work for a couple years in a bigger company to learn more about product management. So that's how I ended up at Intuit. And what was interesting, so I show up at Intuit, I thought I was going to work in some of the new businesses there, and I got assigned to Quicken for Macintosh when there were like six Macs being used. And I was literally writing box copy for like CD-ROMs that were then going to get like distributed to Costco. And I was like, it was such a disconnect from what I thought that I was going to be doing when I arrived in Silicon Valley to what I was actually doing. So I started canvassing the hallways, looking for other projects that I could do, add into it. And I heard through the grapevine that Scott Cook, the founder and chair, was looking for someone to basically think about the mortgage industry. And was there any kind of opportunity for Intuit to get involved in mortgages? And I raised my hand and said, I'd be happy to look at that. Of course, I had never gotten a mortgage, didn't know anything about it, but it seemed like an interesting opportunity. So I worked with the head of TurboTax Engineering, who um, was fantastic, based out in San Diego, and with Scott Cook, and we put together a business plan for what soon became known as Quicken Loans. And so that was a really interesting opportunity, super high risk, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, to be working on something I didn't know that much about, and that became, we got funded by essentially the executive group at Intuit, but ended up being a phenomenal experience. And Quicken Loans now is this huge online lender, very different than what we built at Intuit. What we had built was really the front end part of it, of the online interview and application area. We ended up buying a call center in the Midwest called Rock Loans, combining them, and what eventually that all spun out of Intuit. So Quicken Loans is very much alive and well today, but it actually has very little to do with Intuit except for the name. I think that Quicken Loans is probably the only legacy of the name Quicken really at this point because Intuit has actually sold off those other parts of it. But from that role, once that got spun out, um, and it was 99, for those of you who are out here, it was just kind of a crazy time. And I couldn't resist the temptation to go to a startup at that point. And I was getting calls all the time, and I actually ran into Russ Siegelman somewhere, I guess, who had since left Microsoft and ended up as a partner at Kleiner Perkins. And we went and had lunch somewhere, I think, at the Creamery in Palo Alto. And I said to him, like, how do I even navigate? What do I think about what I, where I should go from here? And he said, well, we're actually incubating a company with Incliner Perkins, an online automotive company similar to what I'd been doing with helping improve the online mortgage experience. I could help reshape, was my vision, at least what I thought, to help reshape the car buying experience was kind of equally broken. And so we ended up joining as the second employee at this company called Greenlight. At the time, it didn't even have a name and working out of Kleiner Perkins' basement for a while, and then ultimately we kind of grew that company, and then we competed with this company called Cars Direct that had raised something like $300 million, which was just kind of basically they were giving cars away for free at that point, and we essentially merged into them in 2001. And that was really fortuitous timing because unbeknownst to anybody that I was working with, I was actually four months pregnant at the time, and it was a good transition point to not go move down to LA where Cars Direct was and to kind of figure out where I wanted to go from here. And this is certainly one of the kind of themes of my career is that different decisions make different, make sense at different points in time. And so at this point, my husband, also an HBS grad, was running a technology hedge fund and was traveling internationally all the time and leaving the house at you know, five in the morning each day. And we basically decided that I was, I knew I wanted to keep working, but that it wasn't gonna work for me to be in the same kind of 70 hour week, um, a hyper kind of entrepreneurial path. So that's when I transitioned to the role at HBS 
running the California Research Center, which I thought I would do for just a couple of years, and it turns out 10 years later, three kids later, 100 case studies later, and a whole bunch of other really interesting work there. Um, ended up doing that for a while until essentially late 2012 when I picked my head up and knew that I was getting really restless and it was time for me to get back into something that had more, just kind of more adrenaline to it. And I, I was just really missing working with entrepreneurs more closely as opposed to kind of chronicling their lives. So one of the board members from the Harvard Business School Center out here, advisory board member, a good friend of mine, Jason Green, I was talking to him about what's next, and he suggested that I meet with the rest of the partners at Emergence, and they offered me a role to come in in a newly created role as an operating partner, which was kind of completely ill-defined. It was essentially help grow Emergence's franchise, help think about how this very strong venture firm that's focused on enterprise cloud can become that much more successful. And so there was a lot of different elements of my emergence. I was part of the investment team. I made some new investments, but I also was responsible for all the marketing, for talent, and working with all of our portfolio companies. It was a great role. I loved what I was doing, and that's what I assumed until about two months ago. That's what I would be doing for the rest of my career. And then over the transom in late January, early February, I got a LinkedIn ping from a recruiter, an executive recruiter at Google, that essentially said, would you be open to talking with Diane Green about enterprise cloud marketing? And of course, I've been following Diane Green for years because she's, um, for those of you who don't know, was um, the founder of VMware, very successful company out here ended up selling it, started a new company called Bebop, had been on the board, actually ironically been to it, but um, Google for four years, and was brought into Google at the end of last year by acquiring her company to build out all of Google's enterprise businesses, which include Google Cloud Platform, Google Apps, and Maps Education, essentially anything that Google's doing that sells into businesses. So I was excited to meet with Diane. It seemed like a really great opportunity. And when I assumed was going to happen is that she was going to pick my brain on great enterprise marketing people because that's what I've been working with was 44, 40 portfolio companies. And it was one of those uh, kind of different points in time that you have in your life where you meet someone and just really click. And so we went met for breakfast at Mayfield Bakery, um, again, down in Palo Alto. And what was supposed to be a half hour breakfast ended up being almost an hour and a half, two hours later. Very wide ranging conversation from everything about my background and her background and Google's opportunity. And I was very frank about what I thought Google from my perspective was doing well and the opportunity, but also all of the areas of growth and improvement. And she asked me at the end of breakfast whether I would be interested in coming over to be the head of marketing for that area which really caught me off guard, to be honest. I was like, wait, me? And so at first I said no, and I said I love my job, I love what I'm doing at Emergence, and it really works in the context of my life. My office is 10 minutes from my house, and I have three kids who are now 10, 12, and 14. And I said no, and then started talking with my husband, and started talking with one or two friends who have known me a long time, actually my closest friend from Yale, who's out here, unfortunately not here today, and I remember going for a walk with her that weekend. And she also went to HBS with me. And she's like, you, you have to pursue this. Like, this is who you are. And this is what you are about. And this is what you wanted to do when you came out of Yale and what you wanted to do when you came out of business school. And so help me kind of reframe a little bit about what it meant to kind of continue to build a career at different phases and points of time. And so after kind of Google called back a week later saying, Can I, would you just meet with one or two other people? I said yes at that point. And then you know, four or five meetings later, about a month or so later, uh, Google asked if I would come over kind of more officially, gave me an offer to come over there. And then the kind of the hardest decision after, the hardest conversation was then reaching out to my emergence partners who I think are fantastic and to actually say to them, you know, you're, you're not going to believe this, but I just got this great opportunity and I think I'm going to take it and caught them completely off guard. But to their credit, they were all so gracious and they're like, that is a really great opportunity. I wish I could like <laughs> tell you you should stay here, but like that's who you are and you should go for it and go do it. So now that's where I kind of am today. And so uh, starting next 
week will be at Google, and the kind of question mark is who knows where that will go. And so the reason I kind of walk you through this whole path is because this is so incredibly nonlinear in terms of, for people who, it'll be interesting, I have my 25th Yale reunion um, this um, at the end of this month, and I also have my 20th business school reunion. And so people who have not seen me for 20 or 25 years, it may seem like, oh, this is kind of what you had wanted to do all along. But for all of those people who have kind of known me over these last 20, 25 years, it's been a pretty circuitous path, actually, to then end up on this role at Google, which is actually exactly the kind of role that I would have imagined and wanted right when I came out of, particularly out of business school. So with that context, I'm going to share some guiding principles about kind of how I've thought about a kind of career navigation for me and then also for other people that I interact with, because I spend a lot of time talking about, with recent graduates about career growth and what that looks like and how I've thought about it. So one of the kind of key principles for me has been always to invest in relationships in all dimensions of your life. This is a picture of my kids. And the reason I included this photo is that it turns out that in one of our last ski trips, one of my son goes to school with the son of Tony Fidel, who's the founder of Nest, who's very involved at Google, and ended up spending a whole day skiing with him. And the, that was what helped me understand a little bit more about what Google was doing in the enterprise and the different opportunities, and has been now someone I've been able to kind of check in with. And it's only because of actually being open to meeting the parents of your kids' friends, and that I really truly believe in this concept of work-life integration. And that's not really about balance, it's about kind of combining everything together. And so that has to do with school networks, I mean, certainly Yale and HBS, fantastic networks, but my kids' school networks and the soccer sidelines and everything that they do, all the different parts of my life all blend together. I've always been on nonprofit boards. That's always been an important part of investing in relationships and things like tennis teams and book clubs and everything like that. So relationships in business, it's they're so far-reaching, and it's kind of incredible to me even in the last few weeks since I mentioned that I was going over to Google, how many people from different parts of my life have reached out of, you know, oh, you need to meet so-and-so, or can I intro to you to this person? And many of those people are people that I know really in very non-work contexts. And so that's been important. Um, second one is seeking out high visibility projects, um, and also which are often high risk. Uh, you know, this this photo is obviously something high visibility, high risk. This kind of like, I don't know, water hoverboard thing. I, if I had actually, my daughter had actually saved all the all the photos, that would have been probably the only one because all the other ones were me falling down, and <laughs> that's the only one that's still on my computer, um, filtered out. But you know, certainly doing the quick and loans business and Intuit was high visibility, high risk to start a new business um, right out of like as a 26 year old at a very successful company is hard. And had it not been successful, I'm sure, um, you know, there'd be a whole other set of stories to talk about. But I've also done projects that have definitely not been successful in other areas. When I was at HBS, the research center, I spent a year looking into HBS opening a classroom in a place out here. It, Wharton had just opened up a place in the city, and I put together this proposal and actually found real estate right next to 101, the Four Seasons and the 101. There was those office buildings there. We had actually like looked at booking out um, space there and making a classroom and sent this proposal over and gave the proposal back to HBS, and they thought about it for a little while and essentially said, no, you know, we're not a school that build classrooms outside in different parts of the US. We're going to do it in Boston. And it totally understood the decision, but it certainly was something that I had invested a lot in, and it got shot down. But what came out of that, interestingly, is the next year when Harvard started building the Harvard Innovation Lab, and I had, over the course of doing that one project about building out here, gotten to know all of these different people at the university. And when it was time to build the Harvard Innovation Lab, I became very involved in that particular project. And everything from the space, to the people, to the hiring, to the activities, to the programming. And that became a really important part of my Harvard Business School role for the last couple of years that I was there. And I don't think I would have ever gotten so pulled into the iLab projects without having done the really failed experiment of building something out here in the Bay Area. 
So you just kind of never know where things are going to go. But when you do these interesting projects, they tend to, even when they fail, and I'm sure you guys hear this all the time, they tend to lead to other things. And I've certainly seen that with um, friends and colleagues out here. This is um, a photo of me, um, kind of painfully, I'm sure, for this room, with it's a whole bunch of Harvard students, and which was one of the uh, Harvard immersion trips out here. One of the things that we did with the office is we used to bring all sets of students, anywhere from 24 to 48 students out here every winter for a week to do an entrepreneurship immersion program. And I would love to see Yale do something like this. And I've been talking with a lot of the groups at Yale, and there's so much good entrepreneurial energy on campus right now. And I know there's a bunch of people today here from the YEI, and Kyle's here from the SOM entrepreneurship. And so it's great that we're seeing all this energy. And I guess my plea to everybody here would be make time for all these students when they come out here because the people in this room will be the ones who are going to be pinged somewhere along the way of can you meet for 15 minutes, can you host a group in your office, can you meet some people for dinner. And this is a really important part of what Silicon Valley is about and you know, hopefully everybody here does this. but. I've always found time for students out here, whether it's been through officially through work or unofficially, and lots of, um, I always invest time in mentoring. I see Jill, one of the people that I work with, I, I've talked to a number of times here as well, that when um, making time to help other people, for, for me particularly, helping other women as something that's really been important, and important for my own growth, and hopefully important for the uh, other people that I interact with. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be formal. It can be very informal. One other thing that I always do, and hopefully everybody else does too, is provide interview feedback. You know, we all interview so many people in so many different times, and the mass, vast majority of those interviews, those people don't get hired. And I have found that generally spending five or ten minutes with people after they don't get hired to share specifically why and to give feedback about what those people could do differently. I've heard from many, many people just how impactful that has been because most people give the kind of platitude, I'm sorry, it wasn't a good fit. And there's so many reasons why something's not the kind of quote, good fit. And often, a lot of those are very changeable in future interviews. It's just the way the person has presented themselves and they actually could have been a good fit. And it's almost more of a personal marketing. So making time to do that for other people or if you're ever interviewing and asking for that feedback, I think is really valuable. Uh, another guiding principle I've seen for everyone out here, and this probably goes without saying for a group of Yaleys, but this kind of constant intense curiosity is what drives so many people here and some of the most successful people I've seen and the most fulfilled are those that have really followed that curiosity, who dig deep, ask the second, third, and fourth question, and then go home and research further and then ask the you know fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth question. It's you know finding something that, you know, why was the Google AI able to beat the Go player this time while well, asking why and what is, what's happening differently now and how did that work differently this time. And being able to kind of go deep is something that uh, I really just appreciated with people out here. And particularly, I think that Yale is more than almost any other people that I know do this naturally. And it's one of the reasons why I love spending so much time with Yale grads. And, and then finally, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and it's, practice isn't the thing you do once you're good, it's the thing that makes you good. And it's something that, um, I don't know, sometimes there's a little bit of a culture of just kind of winging it. And while it's great to be able to wing it in different situations, I think that routinely, and this may be more true, sadly, for women than for men out here, but kind of practicing and kind of going ahead and role play. Even when I was interviewing with emergence and I got an offer and I was going to ask for more money because that's what, um, you know, particularly women don't do and should do every time they get an offer for anything. And I role played with my friend from Yale and said like, okay, this is what I'm going to say. And she's, you had background and she's like, well, this is what they're going to say. And it's like, okay, well then this is what I'm going to say. And kind of role playing it a few times makes it easier to actually do and those are all just different forms of practice. And I have found over the years that, uh, you know, if you have a, a partner or a spouse that you can practice with, or you have friends, or some people have forums like YPO forums or other types of forums, but finding groups of people or friends in this room or whoever it is to be able to share your ideas and play them out, I have found to be very valuable. 
So in th summary, um, I share a couple final thoughts and then hopefully we have time for some questions if you want them either as a group or um, in smaller groups later. It's certainly, the first one is that career planning is so much different than what I thought it was. I don't know why when I graduated from school I just assumed that everything was so linear and that like if I go to Morgan Stanley, I don't know, I assumed then that I would just go on to become a managing director at Morgan Stanley and then my next job I assumed that I would just keep growing there. And it, it doesn't really work that way. It certainly doesn't work that way in tech. It certainly doesn't work that way in the context of having a family and having different points in time when there's different levels of intensity that work in the context of g growth as, um, in the broader in, in life and have found that having these guiding principles has really helped me navigate and others that I know navigate the kind of twists and turns that are appropriate and that just happen in the context of career building. Another uh, one, certainly keeping in touch with people and keeping doors open. It certainly happens, it's easier to do now with LinkedIn and with Facebook and with others and it's part of what going to reunions is all about and it's part of what going to events like this is all about but making the time for some, not just the, the tech connections on Facebook, but personal connections to stay in touch has really been valuable. It's, it's not accidental that Russ Siegelman hired me at Microsoft, then was helpful with me and essentially hired me for the Kleiner Perkins startup that I did Greenlight, and then has been a mentor and a step every step along the way in all of the different decisions we, we've checked in and he's always been a really great sounding board and so having those people and staying in touch with them is really important. And along those lines, remembering to thank the people that help you. It's, it seems so obvious, but it's so rarely done. And making the time to the quick note, sometimes even a personal note is really nice, but just to say thank you because all of us have gotten to where we are in our careers because other people have probably looked out for us along the way and taking that time to say thank you for it. And uh, finally, the last one is, if you do good work, great things happen, and they don't always happen at the time that you think that they are going to. And so as I, when this Google offer came in over the transom, essentially, uh, certainly wasn't looking for it, but it was from years of investing in relationships and investing in skills, and I'm sure I was back-channeled every which way to Sunday, and so you, you know, every, we all get back-channeled for everything that we do, and you never really know when that's going to happen and so the consist the best thing we all can do of course is consistently do great work and then from that all great things so with that um happy to open it up for questions and uh we can go from there yeah uh, you talked about how you had this yearning to leave into it and join a startup uh, i'm just curious if like you still kind of have that yearning and if you were to target a particular startup what would be some of kind of the main characteristics that you would look for yeah, it's interesting because in some ways, I f Google is an enormous company, but in some ways I'm going to one of the more entrepreneurial businesses there because Google's opportunity in the enterprise is pretty new. Everything that it's done so far has really been consumer and advertising related and now selling into enterprises is in competing and not being number one. Google's been number one for so long, but not number one with the Google Cloud platform competing with AWS and not number one in productivity, the Google Apps business competing with Microsoft. So some of the startup elements that I love, I will have there, but it certainly doesn't have the whole resource constraint component. And I have always kind of gone back and forth a little bit between that because certainly an intuit it was at a big company, but Quicken Loans was a startup, and we were very much resource constrained to build that. And then when I went to Greenlight, it was you know me in a room and you know begging for free food from Kleiner Perkins, and that everything was about a constraint, and you make very different decisions then. And one of the roles that Emergence was working with forty plus startups about you who all were living in a resource constrained world, and so. There's never, it was interesting for me though, as much as I worked with all those startups from emergence, I didn't have that kind of yearning to jump into any particular one of them. There'd be times when I'd be like, oh, that would be such a fun role or that would be really interesting. When we made the investment in Crunchbase, for example, that was a really interesting, we were looking for a new CEO and I was thinking, oh, that's a really interesting role. But it wasn't interesting enough that I ever like did anything about it. So for some reason, different 
jobs, and I found this along, kind of catch your fancy at different points in time. And it's hard to know exactly why. And as what I put Google and then question mark, who knows where I'll go from here. But there's something particularly exciting about being part of a startup in that core group. And, you know, Lena to talk through it and others have too, that um, is magical. So if you haven't done it and you're, you want to do it, it's, it's worth doing that as part of a career growth. sure Yale really teaches and um, wondering if you can reflect on it all is especially for young women if you realize um, early in your career you're in a place where you're not getting the risky or high exposure project projects how to actually um, can you reflect more about what walking in the halls entailed and dig a little more into how we might be able to teach young women to do that yeah and men yes so um, I'll take it in two parts. One is kind of what did it actually entail? It entailed proactively meeting with the uh, all the people that interviewed me. When you go work for companies, you often get interviewed by different people in different groups. And then you sometimes never talk to those people again because then you end up in one kind of very defined group. And so for me, what it was was, well, let me go back to all these people that kind of interviewed me and it, to it and sold me on going there and say to them, this isn't what I had in mind. And what do you think I could do? What are some ideas? And so I probably put feelers out to maybe 10 or 15 different people. And not saying that like, oh, I hate my manager, I'm really unhappy. It was more that I really want to work on something entrepreneurial and using the new internet technology. And can you help me be on the lookout for t potential opportunities? What the way it actually rolled out, though, is there was a person um, who was a VP, I guess, in our group, who was aware, who was one of the many people that I talked to. And for about four months, I worked two jobs there. So I, nights and weekends, was writing the Quicken Mortgage Business Plan. And during the daytime, I was doing the Quicken for Mac CD-ROM business. And it took a long time and a fair amount of patience, actually, to do both of these things and have the conviction that what I really wanted to do, this more entrepreneurial endeavor, would actually get some funding and would be able to go forward. And patience was probably the hardest part for me then, because it's still probably a lot of us have issues with patience. But it's certainly coming out at 26 of business school. I, I was ready to get going, and I felt like the internet was happening around me, and why was it taking so long? But it was through that experience uh, of sticking with it, and I, I was cold calling lenders. I was doing whatever it took, and that was valuable. So in terms of broader kind of advice for, you said young women coming out of Yale, but just young people in general, it, it goes to the point of keeping networks broad and having lots of different relationships and asking lots of questions and asking people, how can I help you? And for that, a lot of what I was doing on Intuit then was, Intuit wants to become a more modern internet company. What does that look like and how can I help? And not saying, you know, can you help me? And when you start by asking, how can I help you? Lots more doors tend to open. And I think that that's probably what I would, the advice that I would give. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is really interesting. I have a hard time picking a follow-up question, but I think I have a good one. I had a, I had a, I work for VMware, uh, SOM graduate, and I'm product marketing. So um, I had a lot of trouble picking what to do in my career, almost for as long as I can remember. So your math is interesting, but one thing that broke my confusion a little was a HBS professor. Deepak Malhotra, who addressed the 2012 class, and his quote was, quit often, quit early. And he used that mantra to... to quit often, quit early? Quit okay. often, quit early, something like that. Okay. Uh, do you ever hear that, or what does that mean to you? Um, I know what it means to me is if you don't like something, don't sit in it for too long, take action, 
make a change before you get maybe too negative? Uh, yeah. yeah. I haven't heard that. It's, I think that in some ways my intuitive experience was an example of that, but it was probably a softer, gentler example of rather than quitting and telling my boss, I'm not going to do this quicken job, it was finding an alternative. But I did that maybe two or three months into my job, so that would fall into the early category for sure. I knew that that wasn't where I wanted to be. From that point on, though, I've been really fortunate, and I've had great roles with great bosses. And so for me, that hasn't resonated. The only other time I think that came up is the Harvard Business School role that I was in. I was in that for a decade, and that was much longer than I planned to be in that. And for a whole variety of experience, for reasons, you know, family-related, work-related, health-related, a whole bunch of things, I ended up staying in that role. And it... it there was rarely a time when I really felt like quitting, but when I knew in 2012 that it was time, I got on it. And so sometimes as soon as you have that inkling and you know that something's not working, that would be the kind of often and early. It's not, it's not so much often, but it's make the change because rarely does it get better on its own without doing something. Quit is a little extreme, but transition, yes. I have a question here from James. Um, one of your recommendations was to read a lot. So what has had the most, Im few things that have had the most impact on you or a few things that you read regularly that you think are really worth reading? So lately I've become a little bit of a medium addict, to be honest, and I, I don't know if you, any of you guys have used medium as a great publishing platform that a lot of individuals post on. And I, they're kind of almost bite-sized reads. It says at the top of each of them, actually, how long it will take to read it, usually four or five minutes or something like that. I have found myself in the evenings working my way through a number of Medium posts. And the, the platform does an interesting job of, if you liked this, you might like that, where I might go down the rabbit hole in some artificial intelligence area that I would not necessarily have done three articles later. So I tend to read a lot there. I tend to read, uh, I tend to read a reasonable number of business books, but not all of the books. I'll read a little bit at the beginning, then a little bit there, and rarely do I read a whole business book cover to cover. I listen a lot to podcasts, and that's actually one of the elements. That, it's a bummer that I'm going to have a commute now going from the Mid Peninsula down to Mountain View, but the flip side is that a half hour will be an opportunity to listen. So I really enjoy listening. And more than reading books, I tend to listen to books. I also find it helpful on from just staying on top of news. I use something called Nuzzle and Newzle. And Nuzzle prompts all the things that people in my network are reading. And so I can stay abreast what others are doing. And Newzle is when somebody in my network is involved in something. So I, like, I, I use both of those tools, and I find them helpful. And I actually find it interesting on Facebook to see what other people recommend. So, that's other questions? Uh, yeah, can you stand up? One more question, okay. right. On the topic of transition, for anyone who may be considering transitions, considering that the advice is to do it often, what are you doing to prepare for your transition to Google? <laughs> So that's a tough, it's a good question and a tough question because on one hand, I know that I'm going to be drinking from this fire hose starting next Monday. So there was only so much that I should be doing in advance of that because I'm going to be so all in and this is my one week. And so as I've been like tempted to start reading and doing more and meet with people, I keep actually holding myself back because I know I will, that's essentially I'll be all in. What I have done is I've certainly read up. I've talked to a number of people that I know who are working with Google in one way or another on the enterprise side. So people in our portfolio companies, people that I just happen to know in my network and asking what their perceptions are. Because, because I have a marketing role, a lot of it is understanding what people think about Google and its enterprise offering today and where we need to bring it to. And so I've been doing a lot of asking questions and listening. And reading what the, there's various news articles, what some of the equity analysts are writing, and getting a baseline, essentially, 
and so that's been, I, in some ways, I think the most important part of my transition. That and trying to learn more about the team. I'm, we'll be inheriting a great team of all, a number of different people around the world and learning more about their backgrounds and interests and what drives them so that from day one we can have a great working relationship. Those have been the two main areas. Awesome. 